inflation, resulting in a relatively sharp and sudden fall in its value and a rise in prices. Correct. But that's certainly not what we're told now. No, we're told that inflation is rising prices. Uh, what about inflation? You got, suppose somebody discovered a beach, never been, nobody ever been there before, no sand, all diamonds. He takes back the diamonds, he starts passing around the community, gathering all kinds of wealth and everything. What happens to the value of everybody's diamond? It goes down. Right. Supply and who would dare give one to his girlfriend? <laughs> okay, well, when we come back from the break, what I'd like to do is I'd, I'd like to have you talk about the two aspects of inflation when you list thievery, and you have a wonderful quote from Henry Hazlitt um, on how it can destroy a nation. Right. I'm Elizabeth Allen Hodge. The program is Legislative Watch. Welcome back to Legislative Watch. I'm Elizabeth Allen Hodge, and in the studio today, I have John McBanus, who is the publisher of The New American. He's also president of the John Birch Society and is a very well-respected expert on the topic of the U.S. Constitution. We've been talking about the Federal Reserve. We've been talking about, well, basically America's economic meltdown. And prior to the break, we had talked a bit about inflation, John. You were going to talk about the two aspects of inflation that you mentioned. Well, that's right. <laughs> inflation has two very d disastrous consequences. The first is thievery. Uh, John Maynard Keynes was a British socialist, but before he came to America in the 30s with President Roosevelt and, and started us on a program of you can spend your way into prosperity, which is ridiculous. <laughs> right? uh, he wrote a book in 1920, and in his book in 1920, he talked about the continuous process of inflation that can take the people's wealth, and not one man in a million can understand what happened. Well, that's not true anymore because we've told a lot of Americans what's going on with inflation. Inflation does lower the value of the currency. Now, what happens? Well, let's talk about a man who, in, who uh, inherited a $10,000 in 1945. He could have bought a nice home. He didn't. He put the money in the bottom drawer. Fifty years later, he takes the money out of the bottom drawer, and he couldn't put a down payment on a good home. Where'd the value go? It was stolen through the process of inflation. Inflation takes the wealth of the people into the hands of government, and therefore it's a tax. It's a hidden tax. Most people don't understand it, don't understand. It's thievery, it's abject thievery, it's gone on through the course of history. And I like to say, if you give anybody the power to inflate, he will, right? And so you gotta take that power away. So that's one consequence of inflation. The other one is it can destroy your nation. Henry Hazlitt was a great economist back in the 40s. And he wrote a book, and in his book he said, inflation can lead men to desperate uh, uh, results and it lead them to accept totalitarian controls. So I tell the story about what happened in Germany in the, late 20, in the early 20s. After World War I, Germany was required to pay reparations. They didn't have the money, so they inflated the currency. And in three years' time, one dollar could buy 189 Reichsmarks, and in three years' time, one dollar, four trillion Reichsmarks, oh my gosh. right? Just went ballooned. And in the process, the people lost their homes, their farms, their businesses, became very bitter, and it set the stage for somebody to come forward and say, I'm going to restore German pride, I'm going to get you back, and the, a man named Adolf, yes. right? And that has happened time and again. It happened in, the, in France. The, the French Revolution, they, they inflated the currency wildly, and it led to Napoleon. Right? You go back to uh, Roman times. Uh, Diocletian inflated the currency. Right? Give anybody the power to inflate, he will. But you can't inflate if you have a gold standard, because gold is scarce. So what happened to Fort Knox? What do we have in Fort Knox? Mm -hmm. that's, that's a good question. I know some responsible Americans who were in Congress who went down to Fort Knox, and this has to go back 20 years or so, just to see what was there. And they said, yes, there is a tremendous storehouse of gold. But I asked one man, one of the congressmen who went there, I said, well, who owns it? Oh, I forgot to ask that. Oh. <laughs> we don't know. Right? There is a oh, tremendous my. amount of gold still in Fort Knox. but who owns it? That's something else again. 
So, you know, you've got money is not mystical. There's nothing magical about money. If you don't have money, you have a barter system. And if you're a producer of eggs and you need shoes, you got to find a shoemaker who needs eggs. Right. Right. But what happened throughout the course of history, and it's a very sensible thing, is that people decided on something that everybody valued that could be used as a medium for exchange. Mm -hmm. You go to Holy Scripture and you'll find gold and silver all throughout the course of history. I didn't decide this. A panel of economists didn't decide this. Some economic guru didn't. The accumulated wisdom of history decided it. All right, why gold? It's transportable. It's divisible. It's uh, this, it's valuable, and it's scarce. Scarce, that's what I was going to say. It's that's scarce. Right. Uh, you can't inflate the price of gold. So we had that in our country, early part of the 20th century. And the dollar has shrunk from, five, from 100% value down to 5% value as we got away from gold and silver, and we got to fiat currency. OK, so we went from commodity money to fiduciary money to fiat money. Correct. That's what we got today. Just okay. Fiat. So and and um, we also have a Federal Reserve that many people think is owned by the government. No, it's not. It's privately okay. held. And um, where did it come from? Exactly. <laughs> well, it came from. Uh, it's a parallel to what had happened in Europe uh, with central banks that have power to inflate in their countries. But it also came from the fifth plank of the Communist Manifesto. Karl Marx and Engels wrote that book in 1848. And the famous 10 planks of the Communist Manifesto, number five, is centralization of uh, money in the hands of the state by means of a national bank and an exclusive monopoly. That's what it says. That's the Federal Reserve. Wow. Okay? That's where it came from. Now, it also, in the Communist Manifesto, called for an income tax. Now, we go back to the, the early part of the 20th century, and we find that there's a political manipulator, one of these kingmakers, uh, a man named Edward Mandel House. Mm -hmm. right? House was a Texan, but he had been a manipulator in the state of Texas, but he had his eyes on bigger things. So he decided he was going to be a, a political kingmaker for the nation. And he came up to New York and the, the Northeast and so forth, and he settled on a man named Wilson, and he said, OK. He befriended him. He started flattering him. He started telling him what a wonderful man he was and everything else. And with his connections, he got Wilson nominated to be the presidential candidate in 1912. But House had written a book. And in his book, which is called Philip Drew Administrator, he said he was working for socialism as dreamed of by Karl Marx. Oh my. And in his book, he talked about the need for a Federal Reserve System, the income tax, a rewriting of the Constitution, Social Security System, world government, uh, imperial presidency. He talked about all of that. Right? So when Wilson became president, House moved into the White House. He was President Wilson's top advisor. Uh, Wilson even said to him, he's my alter ego, he's my other self. He's the first man I see every night, every day, and the last man I see every night before I go to bed. House ran the Wilson administration. Oh, my. Right? So, This 19... isn't something you learn at school. No, no, of course <laughs> not. Well, those are the government schools. The government is not going to teach anything in the schools that impedes government power. Mm. And they have a partnership with the Federal Reserve. I should mention that the 10th plank of the Communist Manifesto was free public education for all in government schools. Doesn't it figure? Oh my. Right? In fact, all 10 of those in the Communist Manifesto, all 10 planks, we've got all of them partially or fully in place in the United States today, and it all happened in the 20th century. Why isn't this being taught in school, John? For the very reason I just said. The government is not going to allow teaching in the government schools of anything that's going to impede government power. Right? I'm, I'm delighted to see more and more Americans with homeschooling. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. Homeschooling to me is, is a positive. Now, there are some good teachers in some of the public schools. Oh, there are wonderful teachers. Right, and, and, and they, they, they triumph over the system and they do what they can. Mm -hmm. right. So House and Wilson concocted the idea for a world government. That's part of his book. At the end of World War I, they said, OK, let's have a League of Nations. Right? The United States Senate said, no, 